Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, sorry. Um, that's right after lunch in the poster session, so I'm sure some other folks will trickle in. But there's a busy afternoon, so I figured we might as well uh, go ahead and get started uh, with the afternoon program, beginning with uh, this session, which is uh, a tale of two cities, update on decision support from two leading children's hospitals. I'm not really sure where the uh, title came from. I'm married to an English professor, and I have a five-month-old uh, so in some kind of delirium talking about her work, I, I suppose I came up with, uh, with that title, A Tale of Two Cities. But I guess the most famous line uh, uh, from that book being, it's, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. I don't know which we're in, in terms of the world of clinical informatics right now, probably somewhere in between. I like to think the worst of times are behind us, but there's clearly still much work to be done. Uh, so I'm here uh, along with uh, my colleague, Eric Kirkendall from Cincinnati. Uh, to give an update on some of the work that we're doing on applied clinical decision support at our two children's hospitals. A little bit of a potpourri with some common themes. Um, uh, and so let me start by introducing uh, Eric, um, who uh, has many similarities to myself. My name is Eric Shella, by the way. I'm the Associate Chief Medical Information Officer at CHOP. Um, and uh, Eric Kirkendall uh, is the Associate Chief Medical Information Officer at Cincinnati Children's Medical Center and the University of Cincinnati uh, College of Medicine. He is their first associate CMIO, uh, and he oversees the design, implementation, optimization of the electronic health record and other associated technologies. Uh, he co-leads their decision support analytics work group, uh, which investigates the links between the effectiveness of clinical decision support, patient safety, and user efficiency. He's also an accomplished researcher, demonstrating ties between decreasing alert burden on clinicians, uh, increasing uh, decision support alert salience, uh, and improving patient outcomes. Uh, his research focuses on uh, using electronic health record data to detect safety signals and to intervene, prevent, and mitigate safety events. Um, and so uh, looking forward to hearing some of the work that they have going on, and then um, I'll be presenting a little bit about some of the work we have at CHOP. So thank you, Art. So I guess a tale of two Eric's would have been too narcissistic. But <laughs> um, and I'm not sure which in the next hour, which is going to be the best of times and the worst of times with us, but um, uh, we'll just get started here. So I, I kind of wanted to start by um, offering up a confession, and that is that I'm terrible with email efficiency. Um, and I just had a, an interest in how many folks have the same problem I have. I have a ton of um, email folders that I sort of filter uh, various emails that come across my inbox into, and I, I'm, I'm pretty bad at it, but just by a raise of hands, how many people have at least 10 folders in their email folder? Okay, 15, and keep them up, 15? 20, oh, that's worse than I thought it was gonna be. Uh, 30, oh wow, okay, 50. A couple of people still have them, all right, amazing, <coughs> amazing. Um, so I, I'm probably in that camp somewhere around 30, 30 to 40, but two of the, the sort of heaviest, um, by traffic wise, um, heaviest folders in, in mine uh, are labeled Epic Help and Epic Complaints. Um, and it's not a statement about, um, not like an Epic Hater um, uh, kind of comment, it's just the EHR that we use. It, um, but what that signifies to me is that a lot of my colleagues um, reach out to me um, from operational and research needs to um, address uh, quality or safety problems via some um, technological means. And so a lot of times they're asking for um, some, uh, something they think um, will help with clinical decision support in the electronic health record. And so when I had that discussion with them, I talk about all the different things, whether they're in the EHR or not, is these sort of clinical informatic tools that enable us to do things and not necessarily the end all, um, end all be all solution for their, their everything that ills them. Um, all right, move this forward. Um, but two of those projects that I spend, I've spent a considerable amount of time on in the last couple of years, um, I thought I'd kind of highlight today is, is two such um, uh, projects aimed at, at um, some of the concerns that, that, uh, um, that both I have and I share with my colleagues. Um, the first one I'll talk about is medication dosing alerts. Um, and then uh, the second is this sort of what I think of is, a, is an innovative application we developed in-house to address some situation awareness concerns called guardians. So I'll, I'll give more details about what exactly um, those things are. So a long-standing uh, passion of mine as far as a research and op uh, operations perspective is figuring out how can we optimally set up drug dosing rules for um, the pediatric population. Clearly there, um, this crowd probably doesn't, uh, is no stranger to the fact that there are a lot of um, different things that make dosing pediatric patients 
uh, much more difficult and complex and therefore more prone to error. Um, and so uh, from the previous talk, I sort of had this um, somewhat sensationalistic uh, um, subtitle of are we practicing what we preach? And then usually this is where I insert a joke about um, another research project I have um, teaching babies and toddlers to self-administer meds to avoid parentally administered errors. Um, which <laughs> some, in some audiences, I only get half a chuckle, which kind of frightens me a little bit. But I don't know, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so just this was some of my master's work um, and sort of my first foray into this. So operationally, we went live, we um, bought all these third-party uh, vendor rules, we customized some of them, we implemented it, and turned it on. Um, and basically what happened is this avalanche of alerts, right? So um, ill-fitting, non-specific alerts, um, and even after we did some initial customization. And so these, one of the, well, the research questions I wanted to address early on was, do these sort of clinical e-rules, so these electronic dosing rules that we buy out of the box, um, do they or don't they equate to how we've been taught to um, dose in the past? So using gold standards like Harriet Lane Handbook, um, PDR, Micromedics, LexiComp, et cetera. And the findings which um, were published in Jamie were uh, fairly dismal in that um, when you created that gold standard from those traditional sources, compared them to the e-rules, only a little better than a coin flip at the time did the rules match up perfectly. So there was a little bit of mismatch um, there. And so what that led me to, to um, uh, believe is that these um, low rates of match contributes to high numbers of false alerts. So if people are dosing how they've traditionally been trained um, and the rules don't match that, um, you're gonna get a ton of alerts and then that leads to alert fatigue. People stop paying attention to your clinical decision support and then that leads to um, errors in dosing and adverse drug events. And so this is sort of the, the final conclusion and that, that undermined the clinical decision support we were trying to provide and that basically the users are finding it annoying of limited utility and misleading. And so we tried to figure out how we were gonna address this issue and we thought we would kind of take the Bill Lundberg uh, <laughs> approach. Um, I don't know how many people are Office Space fans, but uh, this is what it kind of felt like. We, we didn't feel like this was a very um, uh, successful approach to just kind of going around and hitting people over the head and saying, come on, pay attention to the alerts that are crappy. Um, so we basically built out, the, um, our key analytic tool um, for studying this phenomenon was this big analytic database where we pulled down all of our um, uh, uh, orders and alerts, kind of combined them all together, and then we could kind of look and see what was going on in the system, try to evaluate some user behavior just purely from the, the secondary use of the data coming out of the electronic health record. And one of the sort of ways that we went about studying at first was we said, okay, well, we know all these overdoses are happening. Let's go look at the tip of the iceberg. Let's go look at what the system is telling us are the most egregious alerts. So these things, and we came up with terms like large overdose and extreme overdose, which were 100% above the upper dosing threshold of, of the, based on those E-rules and 500%. So extreme overdoses were these huge things. And our hypothesis was sort of um, that either those were true errors or that there was some other system issue where the rule was wrong or something that contributed to that, those huge magnitude of doses. And the table's small, I don't expect you to see it, but basically we classified those large overdoses and extreme overdoses into eight different categories. Um, and some of them are, are, are uh, actually kind of interesting. So we, we saw a couple of things that we called miscue errors. So um, for the compound Gil Lightly, um, which um, uh, we give for uh, GI cleanouts, um, the actual chemical name is PEG3350. We saw people writing for 3350 grams. So they were taking the chemical compound for some reason and saying this is how much I want to give and so forth. Those of us in the room that are clinical will know that that's not a huge error, there's not a huge downfall risk from that, but it was just kind of an interesting thing. Um, but by and large, we saw a lot of systems-based issues. Um, so the biggest chunk of these um, uh, errors that we were seeing um, were related to infusion meds. Um, so things we were infusing over eight to 12 hours. The system, the way it was set up was sort of sensing that as a one-time intermittent dose, like you were giving it all at once. And so it said, whoa, 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 there's this huge overdose there. But from out of all that work, and then we proposed some, some sort of technical fixes to the, um, those eight categories, but out of that work, one of the most important things that serves as a basis for some of our metrics of evaluation now is this concept of salience rate. Um, and essentially what it is is the numerator is the number of times that an alert was presented to somebody that it actually led to some sort of corrective action, so it changed practice, over all of the opportunities. So every time an alert fired, what fraction of time did that actually lead to some sort of change in behavior versus overriding, which is um, by far and away the, the most common occurrence um, for us, um, to the point where about 85 to 90% of the time dosing alerts are overridden in our institution, at least 
uh, before we started um, putting a lot of extra time and effort into uh, fixing or addressing that issue. So we, we sort of took uh, the next step. Um, one of the things I was interested in is the so what factor. So, okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, alert fatigue out there. We're generating all this noise. So there's a lot of problems there, but the safety research part of me wanted to ask the question, so what? So what, you know, what are errors are actually happening? And more importantly, how can we kind of automate this, put some um, electronic algorithms in place to overcome some of the scalability issues? Because um, if you go back and look at the um, error rates in the literature, a lot of them are um, manual reviews. Uh, so pharmacists will go behind a bunch of orders and review them and, and figure it out. So I said, well, what can we do to kind of automate that process? Again, busy slide, uh, manuscripts in progress. It should go in the next week or so for submission. But um, essentially, uh, what we did is we took mo the, the data that we had before in our, our database. We added in MAR data to it so we could tell which orders were actually reaching the patient. And so I'll just kind of walk you through it here. But um, so over here, we, we took the use case of uh, three different commonly prescribed antibiotics. So amoxicillin, um, amoxiclavulinic acid, or augmentin, uh, and clindamycin. So three very commonly prescribed um, medications in pediatrics, or three common antibiotics. And we said, show us all those orders over a couple of years. So we had about 55,000 orders. Um, let's see if the pointer no, doesn't show up there. Um, and then we said, OK, which? Which of the, um, those orders did the system think was an overdose? So by the rules that were in place then, how many um, were overdose orders? So single dose overdose orders, there were only about 3,000 of those. You follow that through, um, this is sort of the user response to those alerts. So by uh, far and away, the most common um, occurrence was that folks overrid, overrode those alerts and said, keep going. Um, so we took those orders. We looked at um, uh, how it, if there's any modification between the time that they were written and the time they reached the patient. So did the pharmacist intervene or did the prescriber go back and say, whoa, that, wait a minute, that was a, that was a bad order. And then again, the sort of next steps were the sort of advancement on the tools that we had before. So we said, okay, how many of those, of those 2,200 orders that the system thought was an overdose that actually got out to, or were actually sent out to the patient, how many of them were actually delivered? And only about two thirds of those were delivered. Um, so about 1,400 orders that were thought to be single-dose overdose by the system um, were actually documented on the MARS being given to the patient. And then we said, well, we know the rules by the inspection of the rules, they don't look that great. We know we got some work to do there, but um, what if we take that sort of gold standard, so how people are actually prescribing, um, and apply that over top of those uh, rules, how many of those filter out and are true clinical overdoses? So we've gone from about 3,000 orders that the uh, system thought were overdoses and got down to about actually 539, um, of which about 2,300 different um, administrations of, a, of what the system thought and we clinically validated as being overdosed. So we've now tied that all together and we can tell across the whole medication use process of uh, what percentages of meds are ordered or overdoses or true overdoses and actually reach the patient and cause some clinical issues. Um, and I left out the results slide, but um, essentially what we found with, with those antibiotics, we know that they're the dose dependent adverse events are things like loose stools, um, C. difficile infections and so forth. And so when we looked at the data, we've actually seen the patients who received true, and this is not a um, groundbreaking finding, but the patients who received true clinical overdoses have higher rates of loose stools. The C. diff didn't pan out because we didn't have enough numbers to be statistically significant, but at least we showed um, in our initial uh, uh, sort of use case that um, those folks are seeing some uh, uh, safety outcomes associated with overdoses. Um, looking at back at those rules, we said, okay, well, the rules, we know there's an issue with the rules, so let's go fix that. We went back and changed and modified our rules and customized it. And each one of the vertical lines in this graph represents a, a change in the rules um, when we did it over time. And you can see beforehand the, the um, blue line is the uh, total number of alerts pertaining to those antibiotics per month. And you can see after, after we changed, we started to see decreases in the number of those alerts that were being shown to users. Um, and that wasn't terribly shocking because the, um, the, the rules, the e-rules tend to be more conservative in nature. And so we liberalized the rules a little bit to match clinical practice, appropriate clinical practice, and we saw a decrease in the number of alerts per month. Um, looking at that salience rate, so how, how often did um, uh, the prescribers actually heed the alerts and um, correct behavior? we saw this um, concomitant increase in the salience. So to us, that signals that we changed the rules and made them more clinically appropriate. And now it actually, 
what I was worried about before this happened was that there were, these were just a small portion of the alerts that people see. I was worried about them getting um, sort of deluged with the, all of the alerts and not being able to see individual um, outcomes increase like this. But what we've shown is that by just changing a handful of rules um, that we can actually increase the salience rate um, for those electronic rules. So it gives us hope that we can kind of chip away at this problem. Um, uh, one of the uh, biomedical informatics guys that I work with is on our research team then came to us one day sort of unsolicited with this int very interesting graph. So here the red is the total number of single dose overdose alerts. And so what you can see is that as those um, numbers started to decrease, this, so again alert exposure decreasing, um, the percentage of alerts that were coming from the custom rules increased. Um, and so this goes along with our modification of those rules. So we changed some of the rules around, um, and, we, and there were a lot of other projects that were modifying a lot of other rules than just this one. But to me, what that signifies is that we're sort of gaining more control over the alerts. So the total burden, we're, as we chip away at this problem, the total burden is coming down, and the salience across the board is, uh, um, is starting to rise a little bit. Um, but the more, the, the greater proportion of the alerts that are actually causing the rules are, cu are customized are rules. So it seems to me like we have a little more control over things. Um, we're not yet to the stage where we've gone through and sort of calculated the decrease in alert burden um, and not done anything like a time, time derived activity based cost analysis or anything like that where you can sort of calculate how many clicks we're saving and then how, many, how much time of a clinician and then how much are, are we gaining back in cost, et cetera. Um, but we think our alerts overall, the data we have is looking very, um, optimistically looking at it, it looks like the, we're, we're making some progress. The question for us from, from here on out is are we, are we starting to really change safety outcomes? So um, one thing we're gonna do with the antibiotic thing is continue to follow that over time, go back and look at the data after we've changed and see if our, our rates of um, blue stools and adverse events from the antibiotics have, have decreased over time. Um, so looking ahead and, and trying to scale this out a little bit, um, uh, we do think there's gonna be some scalability issues here, so um, we, we have to, Think about that. Um, our rules corpus has about oh, 300,000 um, rules or such, and it's it's sort of like the universe. It's ever expanding, so every time you check in, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which is harder to do on a manual maintenance um, uh, sort of methodology. So we're looking into how do we how do we automate that and um, and, and address the scale issue, um, and then once we make those changes, how do we know the changes are actually doing anything? So can we set up this whole whole system around our, our analytic database to kind of analyze? Um, the implementation of those rule changes and see if we're actually creating any out, um, any difference in outcomes. Um, so this, so one of the things that we've um, started uh, moving towards, and there were a couple of great um, uh, presentations this morning talking about visual analytics. So we're starting, we took a page out of our um, CHOP uh, colleagues' book. Um, we were talking with them about their strategy for decreasing other types of alerts, and they've done some advanced analytics that um, I, I think Eric will show you in a little bit. So we started playing around with that as well, and, and we're implementing this into our sort of work cycle so we can visually analyze, an, analyze figure out which rules um, to change, and which ones give us sort of the biggest bang for the buck. Because it doesn't cost, generally speaking, it doesn't cost our pharmacist um, any extra time to change one rule from the other, so how do we go and select the ones that are more important to, uh, um, to analyze? So we're creating things like bubble charts with three and four dimensions and, and that, that kind of thing to help, us, help guide us on which ones to switch, um, change. So I'm gonna change gears and talk about the second project. Um, and uh, this is the Guardians project. Uh, and basically, you can see some of my co-collaborators there back at Cincinnati. What the Guardians project is, is it was, a, it was meant to address this issue that we have at, 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 um, back home. And that is, we have so many QI and safety thing initiatives going on that the, um, especially the nurses, the clinical unit managers, medical directors, have a, such a hard time managing all this data. They're trying to take care of the patient clinically, but then they've got all these other things to, to track and um, so forth. And so we heard from a, a bunch of our frontline providers that the, the more layers of things that we add on um, to their to-do list, the harder it is to manage. And they sort of can lose sight of what's going on with some of the patients in, on, on their unit because they're trying to just run around and do all these different things and they're trying to pull data from all these different data sources. So we have all this data that we're just kind of um, hitting them like a fire hose. And then they don't do things that they should be doing, like using the problem list to, to, to document these issues. So um, Beam will send me this one. Um, and this is common, right? So somebody, actually I've sat in meetings, I said, well the answer is we need to put this on the problem list so we can drive clinical decisions for it. And somebody goes, oh 
that's okay for this project, but nobody nobody uses the problem list, so it's not going to work. And it's like, well, it's kind of a catch twenty two. So we're, we're we like a bunch of other folks are trying to get to that critical mass of ingraining that that curation of the of the problem list. But Guardians is a is a, a big long backronym, which you can see across the top. But essentially, what it is is it's a, a real time web based application that's meant to help those clinical unit directors and managers. Um, manage all those extra tasks. So it's not meant for the bedside nurse who's um, providing direct care. It's really like kind of a unit management tool, an organizational wide management tool. And what it does is it aggregates and displays uh, situation awareness data around safety, patient flow, and patient family experience. And I guess just to back up a second, so situation awareness just means that you have that um, sort of keen understanding of what's going on and you can kind of prioritize um, tasks to know which patients are the sickest, for instance, on your unit in the face of a lot of um, complex information coming from different areas. And so our clinical units, uh, uh, leaders are using this um, application and some of our pilot units now are trying to roll it out um, hospital-wide. Um, uh, but we, uh, we kind of piggyback on some other thing, um, other initiatives where they were already using secure mobile devices out on the unit. So we've actually designed it so you can pull it up in any web browser, um, but uh, it, it can be um, used on an iPad minis, for instance, as well, which most of the units have. The main three objectives that we were trying to address with this application were one, to in just increase the overall situation awareness, have some shared mental models across the institution um, about um, the, the different statuses of patients, um, optimize the efficiency in delivering that essay information. So we could build out a lot of this. So the first question I usually get from folks is, why didn't you do this in the EHR? And there are some tools there and so forth. And our answer was is that we couldn't quite get it there in as granular fashion as we wanted and make it as agile. Um, it, I mean, if you really want to boil it down to something simple, you could say click count, right? So to go look at all these different views, you had to go, the, the best way we construct it still required a bunch of extra navigation. And so um, we sort of uh, um, dis went out and did some user-centered design to overcome that issue. Um, and then the third thing is um, the, the gold standard still at our hospital in most units is for nurses, to charge nurses to sort of do their handoff, write things down on, on paper and then update that periodically throughout the day. But the problem is that they're not um, uh, constantly updating things. That, that information can get out of, out of date pretty quickly. And so with the Guardian's application, they can log in, they get that real-time information. We have real-time data feed. So as soon as somebody documents something in the record, um, it shows up in the application as well. So they have that right at their disposal. Um, so some, some things that we think are kind of unique about it. So one, we're, we're taking advantage of a lot of these, um, these data windows, these APIs, or application programming interfaces. Um, that are, are not new to um, software in general, but fairly fairly new and becoming more robust in the electronic health record market now. So um, almost by the, the, the day or week, um, more and more of these uh, vendors are adding to their API catalog. So it makes it easier to shuttle this real-time information around. Um, the, the entire we, um, application itself we, we view as a framework. So while we're addressing specific use cases here, we've also built it out and architected it from the very beginning try to make it as flexible as possible and then eventually portable once we decide we want to, uh, once we um, try to get it outside of our own walls um, after it passes through the, the testing phase, the alpha site testing phase. Um, and then, uh, again, to this audience, this isn't really a novel thing, but the last thing is sort of the, like clinical decisions support mantra, right? Getting the right information to the right people at the right time, the right channels and format. Um, so just a quick pic um, picture of all the different technologies we're using that, that are in our stack. Um, so we're using um, sort of the latest and greatest as far as HTML5 and CSS3, and um, our guys are always kind of swapping out JavaScript libraries and everything. So, um, but then the sort of how-to, how do we, how do we do this? So um, again, we use Epic. Uh, so we use the um, Epic um, underlying infrastructure, in particular bridges and interconnect to kind of connect all this and send the data over to this integration middleware that we have and then our applications um, attach to that integration software, and so we get these, these real-time feeds. Um, the application itself, which I'm gonna try to hopefully successfully demo here in just a second, um, sort of has on the risk side, the risk management side, has three level of views. So there's an organizational view, a unit level view, and then a patient level view. So you can kind of drill up and down very quickly um, and get this sort of top-down approach to the entire organization or you can drill down in and see what's going on with one individual patient. And again, this is targeted at those sort of unit managers, not the folks who, not the bedside nurses who should be in um, Epic getting all that clinical decision support that we build in there. So, and then each of those views has different targeted users and different critical components. So I kind of touched on, on those three things there. 
So that's the risk side. On the flow side, which is kind of just in a prototype phase now, um, we've incorporated a lot of the work that we've done around uh, managing bed capacity and patient flow. And um, so we have, a, like most large institutions, we have people who are in charge of deciding which patients go where. Um, and as a very um, sort of dynamic institution with high flow, um, it can be a little overwhelming managing all that data. And so we went, sat down, met with them, and, and prototyped up um, uh, part of the application to address those issues and help them better place patients. So um, I put the little fingers crossed thing there because demos almost never go well live. But um, I have backup slides in case that uh, doesn't happen here. And I, I, I'll say that as long as the Wi-Fi holds out, we should be good. And there's a scrambler here, so all the patient data that you see is going to be fake patient data. It's obfuscated and... Um, I meant to end the PowerPoint. Oh, does it not want to... doesn't want to switch over. All right, let me see if I can... Oh. And then just end the Back slides. Back out of that. Right? It didn't want to. I think you're good. All right, we'll see here. Okay, there we get. Um, so this is that organizational top-down sort of view. So all these are all the units in our hospital. So A3 North, A3 South, um, on down. So all the each unit is represented by a tile. Um, across the top, we have a little bit of patient census information. So right now we have 475 patients um, in the hospital. We got 140 available beds left. Um, but this is the risk module, and so each of those buckets I talked about, so safety, experience, flow, those are all listed down the side, and then we have a separate um, situation awareness bucket for some of our higher priority measures. And what this allows you to do is sort of get in and, and filter the data that you're looking at. So each of the tiles, just to kind of orient you, each of those four areas of SA um, safety, experience, and flow are represented by um, a, a round dot here, and the number pertains to the number of those concerns on the, that unit. And so what you can quickly do um, with the gradients, the color gradients here on the, in the view is, is just sort of um, scroll the entire institution and pick out where the hot spots are. So for situation awareness, if you kind of concentrate just on looking at the red dots and scroll, you can see pretty quickly that A5 Central, um, which is our sort of hemob and T unit, has the most um, SA concerns right now. Um, and then um, our, our Lindner Center um, a mental health uh, facility has the, the next number. Um, and then there's, uh, again, some more bed acuity information here. So you can see quickly that A3 North has 20 patients. They have two open beds, so they're sort of in the red as far as acuity goes. So we have to be careful about what patients we place there. But from, if we want to know which patients in the hospital are on, say, high-risk therapies, we can click and it will um, sort of um, uh, filter out that information. And it looks like some of the programmers were having fun with some Game of Thrones fake names here. It's Targaryens <laughs> have made it on here some literature references and so forth and actually I noticed one day they put my last name in here too which I know is not in any library they sort of were messing with me a little bit but um, but at any rate um, that's sort of the organizational wide view if you want to drill down into any one particular unit for instance and click on A6 South it'll load um, again fake patients but you get a little more information about all the patients that are on that unit um, and this is sort of gibberish because it's going through the scrambler, but this would have clinical information pertaining to what those risk indicators are. And then if you scroll down even further, um, we provide the only area in the, is a, a big part of the sensitivity at, at Cincinnati is on nursing <coughs> workload and data entry. And so this is the only place in the application where they will actually enter any data. And this is just meant to be that place where they write their handoff summary notes. Um, and then on the devices, you can swipe um, on the web browser, though you kind of have to move from side to side, but you can look at um, very high level, their recent vitals, um, problem list items, that, those sorts of things. So there's a handful of uh, um, high level information in there as well. Again, meant for the, the clinical unit managers. And then this is the, the, the flow side. So this is sort of the um, in prototype, so it's not nearly as pretty and sexy as we, we would envision it to be. Uh, but essentially, you have all the units now down the left-hand side. There's a little watcher icon here to tell us that there's a, one of the sickest patients in the hospital is on A3. And then two columns of numbers here. The first is um, the number of available beds that are out there. So um, uh, you can look and see that A4C2 has zero beds available, so they're at capacity right now. And then the second column is our predictive um, uh, number. So at the end of the day, how many beds would that unit have left based on the predicted number of admissions, the min a number of discharges, et cetera. And so you can tell right now, looking at our historical models, how many more admits A4C2 would get throughout the day, it looks like 
the, the net balance is that they would be over by one patient. And so what that tells them is the next, next patient that comes along or one of them, they should try to divert to a different, different unit. Um, and then we sort of have the um, overall unit census at the top and then the, and individual sort of um, uh, clinical domains here. And then you can split out and expand all of these to get more detail about the capacity on each unit. But say we want to go look at this um, A3 South uh, a little more detail. Um, you can drill down and it gives you the numbers that drive those, the, the, both the currently available numbers and the predicted numbers. Um, and then um, for the, you know, if you wanted to look at information on the watcher, you could click here and more patient information would would pop up over on that side. And the way that we use this tool is in our safety huddles every day that we have three times a day. So the nurses representatives show up at these huddles, they run through um, different numbers uh, and safety concerns. And so that's meant to be that platform that the person running that can just go down by unit, look at those numbers and, and um, discuss those with folks. And the other thing else I, I didn't show is that on the flip side, the unit representatives are, are reporting out um, things like these numbers. So what's our current capacity? What's our admission to discharge? Um, so our fl what's our flow look like in, um, overall? And then staff acuity and staff ratios, we have other sort of data coming into this. So it's not all just coming out of, out of Epic, it's coming from multiple places. So they can say right now it looks like A6 South um, needs some help as far as staffing goes. So they may need more nurses and so forth. So let me see if I can flip back over to the presentation. Um, and I will say that we are trying to formally evaluate this right now. I have IRB approved study, we're doing surveys, we're following all these measures kind of in the, in the background. Um, but uh, the implementation has been a little bit of a challenge um, just across the different units. And so um, we're still trying to, to um, piece that together and get good information to make sure that we are really are achieving those three objectives uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I think I'm, I'm running over here, so I'm not gonna spend too much time, but we, we're, we're, we're basically trying to use this to try to help hardwire this culture of SA around our institution and promote this data-driven culture. Um, and um, free up some of our clinician time um, that they spend hunting for, for data. Um, and then lastly, just my, my transition slide. So um, <laughs> Eric and I do a lot of presentations together. It's like an Eric and Eric show. Uh, and so I don't know if anybody's big Zoolander fans, but um, uh, we've had some fun with some memes lately. So this is one I made up as a transition slide. So. Thank you, Eric. I uh, continue to be impressed by that application whenever I see it. I've now seen it a couple times, uh, and I'm glad he got the opportunity to demo it because, uh, full disclosure, it's, it's, I think, way cooler than anything I'm going to show you guys, um, uh, which is fine because hopefully I'll be able to uh, replicate it in some way or we'll be able to replicate it in some way at CHOP, and I just continue to be very impressed with how Eric balances clearly his research uh, work and, and still meeting the operational needs of Cincinnati Children's in a way that I very much admire and uh, and strive towards. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of a CDS uh, and quality improvement update from CHOP, a little bit of something old, something new. Uh, the something old is going to be a common theme for both of us, alert fatigue, tried and true topic for any clinical informaticists. Um, and then something new, I'm going to be talking about uh, an emerging partnership that we have with our rapidly growing quality improvement program and where I think it's been uh, a win for, for both of these groups, but also a learning experience. Um, so, uh, and, and some of the development challenges in CDS uh, that, uh, that have fed into that partnership and where I think we've, we've grown and still have more to grow. So alert fatigue, uh, you may remember, since I'm sure you all were here three years ago and remember very well the talk I gave on our uh, initial alert fatigue work. Um, I was on this stage or, or one room over maybe, uh, talking about our initial uh, attempts to visualize, in that case, or really better understand our medication alert problem, uh, which we definitely had. So around 2012, we had just gone live with inpatient Epic being live on ambulatory for quite some time, and we found that we had a significant alert problem turning on some vendor out-of-the-box alerts. Uh, ours actually were not so much dose alerts, because we had actually had a heavily customized dosing scheme. Um, not to say they were perfect, but they weren't our biggest problem. Our biggest problem was really uh, drug-drug uh, interaction alerts, in particular for our pharma pharmacists who had a little bit of a lower, a much lower threshold for alerts. Uh, and so just to orient you to this graph, the, the size of the bubble represents the relative volume of alerts, um, the blue being pharmacists, the red being prescribers, uh, and the uh, height of the bubble represents the override rate. Uh, and so, uh, and the number here, which in this is really the rate of, of alerts. 
And so what we were seeing, in short, is that our pharmacists were seeing a drug-drug interaction alert for 26% of all medication orders. And our concern was that this giant balloon of drug-drug interaction alerts was raising the override rate for all of these other alert types. Uh, our prescribers also had a problem, but you see that alert, uh, alert override rate of 95%, which is very uh, consistent with, uh, with the literature and what other hospitals have experienced. And you see our dose alerts are still pretty high, um, uh, better, but still pretty high. And so this is the work that I presented a couple years ago where, we, uh, where really the focus was uh, getting a handle on all of it. That initial graph was actually from uh, just a, a quick snapshot. So our first focus was getting a handle on all these alerts, and so we built a dashboard to pull all of this data directly from the relational database that Epic dumped to. Um, and these were, uh, this was the entire volume of alerts displayed visually. Um, uh, and we saw that initially when we dropped the volume, we saw an improvement in the override rate. Uh, and so this was just an initial cur uh, uh, course analysis. But what we've done since then is do a much more rigorous analysis and I think fa have found some interesting conclusions. Um, so this is sort of repeating in a much uh, more robust uh, display uh, the, that we decrease the volume for pharmacists. So the, this is showing the decrease in volume of alerts when we turned off uh, with a very, uh, a very uh, intense uh, process where we vetted the individual uh, drug-drug interactions, used our dashboard to see which ones were firing frequently, and then went through our therapeutic standards P&T equivalent committee to turn those off. And so we saw a significant drop in the volume and a series of three interventions for our clinical pharmacists in the drug-drug interactions, going from um, their overall alert rate, so the 25% was just drug-drug uh, interactions, but when you added them all, they were seeing uh, alerts between dose allergy for almost two-thirds of medication orders, a, a staggering number. We cut that uh, rate for them by, uh, to, uh, by greater than 50%, and that oh, got it down to 30%. Still way too high, but, uh, but progress, clearly. But then when we really started to look at um, the override rates, and this is sort of getting to the, 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 uh, the idea of salience that Eric was talking about, we saw that by absolutely decreasing the noise, there was a change in behavior towards the signal. And so this, was, uh, this is a, a graph of the override rates in response to those analogous decreases in volume. So we saw the override rates drop for all alerts by pharmacists, from that high 95% to, to around 80%, and an increase in that cancel rate um, for those alerts. Well, this just tells it that we that we turned off a lot of noisy alerts, and then people paid uh, that people overrode them less. So, not entirely surprising. Um, but then, when we focused on a subset of those drug-drug interaction alerts that we didn't touch, ones that were present before and present after, excluded all the noise from both the pre and post, we saw a, a similar drop. Uh, in that override rate. And so this really told us that some of the signal was getting some better attention uh, than the noise. Now largely a lot of those drug-drug interaction alerts that remained were still pretty bad. Um, but, but this really showed us that, uh, that decreasing that noise could absolutely uh, have an impact on the actions that these pharmacists were taking. Um, and we learned one other interesting thing, which was that, and this certainly ra raised questions that, that hopefully somebody will, will push towards answering, was that the biggest decrease in, uh, in that override rate change for these untouched drug-drug interactions did not happen at intervention two, where we really dropped the most volume, but it actually happened after intervention one, which is a relatively modest decrease in volume on the left, with a correspondingly significant increase, or significant decrease in the override rate. Um, so this led us to think, is there something about this you know, objective rate of, um, uh, Oh, there it is. Uh, something about this objective rate that is perhaps some kind of threshold. Um, obviously, it's a complex human-computer interaction equation, but um, this, we felt, maybe took one additional step towards trying to determine what are maybe these rates of, of alerts, interruptive no, uh, modal alerts, that we need to start worrying about. <clears throat> so that's an update on our alert fatigue work. The, the work continues, as it always does, in both refining the, the quality of the content that's feeding these alerts, but then also giving people more meaningful actions they can take from them. So the next topic I want to talk about is, uh, um, is related to uh, clinical decision support design and, and quality improvement. Um, so we 
started to develop a theme of problems when it came to implementation of, of decision support. We often found we got to a scenario like this, where somebody had built something great, or what they thought was great, but nobody was using it. And that was in the better case scenario. We also certainly found times where we built something that we thought was great, but actually it had some significant unintended consequences. Um, and these design problems, as we uh, describe them, although it could sometimes be safety issues, had a couple of um, had a couple of sources, I would say, or a couple of uh, roots in what led to them. Often we had very eager people, clinicians, really wanting to solve problems, uh, and they would jump to that solution for the problem before really doing a deep understanding of the problem. Uh, does that, raise your hand if that has some resonance with, with processes you've seen. Okay, so it's, it's a similar theme. Uh, and I think part of that is just the, the, uh, the problem-solving nature that we have as clinicians, but then there's also just this sense of familiarity where, uh, where we, we're familiar with something, we're familiar with the hammer, and I see a problem over there, well, I'm gonna go after it with the hammer. Um, and so there was often just that ubiquitous tool that kept, get, you, kept being used over and over again without that uh, workflow analysis to really see if it was the right tool for the job. And this was leading to processes that were certainly inefficient, a lot of back and forth between design and requirements and clinicians, uh, definitely poor satisfaction and sometimes dangerous. Uh, not quite as dangerous as Kathy Bates there, but, um, but certainly, uh, certainly had the potential for unintended consequences. So what this led to, or one of the things this led to, is, uh, is a partnership that I think is where I'm going to spend the rest of the talk um, uh, talking about. Um, partnership between our newly established, or recently established, Office of Quality Improvement uh, and our informatics expertise, both some of our, our, some of folks from our research end and then some of the operations end of our informatics where there's a fair amount of overlap. Contributing to what I think and a lot of us think has really been an improved process. And so each of these groups brought something very, or brought some very valuable things to the table. From our informatics folks, it was clearly CDS expertise, both in uh, the knowledge of the system, but also an understanding of workflow analysis. Um, IS resources, uh, which are, are always constrained any place, and so having some of those dedicated resources, and some data and visual analytics experience in terms of looking at some of the process metrics or, or knowing where the data is in the system to, to drive decision support rules. From our quality improvement team, they also had some, a fair amount of experience with visual analytics. We have a, a data warehouse that they, that they leverage and use to demonstrate or to support process or patient outcomes. But really, I think the key thing they brought, the key two things they, they brought to the table was an improvement framework, which was, was uh, our improvement framework, very similar to others, rapid cycle improvement, tests of change, and ideas. So grassroots ideas from the, from the population for problems that they're trying to solve. Uh, and that really has been a, a, a key, have been key elements for moving some of these projects forward. And the benefit has been, I, I believe, uh, really improved development of decision support that is quality improvement focused and, and driven towards better processes and ideally better outcomes. So it was definitely a learning process for both groups. We both, both teams had to really sort of step outside their comfort zone. For the QI team, uh, I think they had, they definitely got a, a crash course sometimes the hard way and some of the unintended consequences of clinical decision support and started to learn some of the long established and emerging best or better practices in CDS design. And then also learning about our EHR infrastructure and how we have all these little pockets of expertise and, uh, and what strengths we have and, and where their resources can best integrate. For the informatics team, I think that this has really was a learning experience in how we can have dedicated resources to do new tool exploration. So much of our, especially for our operations folks, is about you know, keeping the lights on or breaking things that fix. And rarely do we have opportunities to explore something that is really proactive uh, and has the potential to drive yeah, a new process, but a new outcome for patients. Um, but then also I think that getting agile, and I'm speaking agile from sort of a programming perspective. I think often the IS projects are sort of very top-down waterfall approach where you gather all the requirements and sort of march your way forward. The QI projects uh, in their grassroots nature and, and, and rapid cycle improvement would have iterative tests of change where you might be changing something pretty quickly, measuring outcomes, and then making another change very quickly in your, in your, in your CDS presentation or in, in something. 
Um, and so that was something that was kind of unfamiliar for us on the uh, applied clinical informatics side. I think our, our, our research informatics folks probably had some familiarity with that. Um, but we didn't really have the tools available to be doing those kinds of small tests of change. So it was definitely something new for us. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the education piece because this is, has been a, a, work, a lot of work that I've done along with Eli Lurie, uh, Dean Caravidi, and Joe Zork, which I think is bringing some of these concepts of uh, clinical informatics and decision support design to people who have no intention of becoming uh, clinical informaticists. Uh, they don't want to sit for the boards. They don't want to learn about data standards. They just want to take care of patients. But they are often in the position of having to think about these tools because they use them every day. So I'm going to, I'll spend a little bit of time talking at a high level about some of the lessons and, and the ways that we communicate those lessons to that audience, even though it's lo I'm largely preaching to the choir and preaching to preachers in many cases. Um, so I think the first thing to make clear to them, which, which, they, which they probably knew on some level, was that these tools actually weren't just about you know, getting a great outcome, but also about avoiding harm. And we've all heard about or seen firsthand uh, decision support or EHR interventions that have led to harm. Obviously unintended, but they have led to harm. And then also the concept that really there's a lot of overlap in the work that we do in the EHR and quality improvement. Um, this is a, sort of a, a theme that I'm, I'm taking from BMAL uh, on an email he sent to, to a very uh, broad listserv um, about how really everything we do in the electronic health record is ideally fitting into one of the six quality domains specified by the, by the IOM. Um, that it be, that, uh, Medicaid, uh, that um, uh, care be safe, effective with pathways, patient-centered, patient portals, timely automated referral systems, efficient, we see that in order sets and other workflow um, uh, um, improvements, um, speed buttons or whichever, and equitable. Again, this sort of fits into the standardization. We all get the same order set regardless of, of who the patient is or where they come from. So, a definite sort of alignment. We all really want the same things, both from the EHR side and from the quality improvement side. And then my very basic definition for them on what decision support is. You're giving a clinician or somebody some information, it could be a patient or a family, and you want them to take some action with that information. Um, and then, uh, and then, then going into a little bit of time on unintended consequences. Uh, of decision support. Now, I realize both of these things come from Penn, but, that, uh, but I think it's more a reflection of the great work that they're, that they're doing. This is not meant to be a slight against their decision support, um, uh, but really the great literature and work that's come out uh, from, from Penn um, on some of the early unintended consequences uh, of decision support. So I give them examples of, of uh, this is some of Ross's work on sort of in vitro uh, um, unintended consequences of, of CDS, 22 new types of errors that, that were facilitated by the EHR. Um, and then one from practice where they did a randomized controlled trial of a, of a hard stop uh, that ended up getting terminated early because of uh, unintended outcomes. And then once I've gotten them very scared and depressed about how uh, dangerous these tools are, I start to turn the page and talk about what are some of the uh, better, best practices that have emerged uh, related to CDS design. So things like the Ten Commandments, as they started, I think, in 2001, 2002, and of course the Five Rights, which I won't go into in great detail here. Uh, but this is something that is very new uh, to this audience. And then I also spend a little bit of time, because these are all largely clinicians who are, or former clinicians who are part of the QI group, and then there's also an OC, uh, Office of Quality Improvement course, um, where I do a decision support class with Joe Zork, trying to get them to think about decision support in the same way that they think about a diagnostic test. So here's our two by two table, which, which probably makes some people um, feel either sleepy or nervous um, or reminding them of med school. Um, but just like in a diagnostic test where we have a disease state and a test state, for decision support, you have a condition state. They've met some condition uh, or they have some condition. Maybe it's a disease, but maybe not. Um, and you have a CDS trigger. And just like with a test, you have true positives, false positives, all the things that we've been hearing about uh, in the great presentations today. And what, I, what we try and get across is that just like uh, in, in diagnostic tests, we have sensitivity and we have positive predictive value. But that what we've done pretty well in the past is we, we've felt a lot of great tools with great sensitivity, but we've often fallen short on positive predictive value. And it's less about one or the other, but more bringing some of these things into alignment, particularly when it comes to positive predictive value. And that the, uh, the, the precision of the CDS, 
um, or, or the positive predictive value, sort of the analogous terms, really helps determine what a lot of the format should be for CDS and the action. And the number on the, the, X, the y axis here is, is nothing that's standardized uh, in terms of what positive predictive value leads you to, to have a certain action. Uh, but, but the concept is that, um, is that with something that is going to be more reliable, you probably have license to be more prescriptive about it or be, maybe be more intrusive about it. Now, obviously, this is one of the many factors that feeds into decision support. If it's something that's you know, regulatory versus you know, impending, uh, impending cardiac arrest, you have to factor that in as well. But often, again, we go to the hammer, we go to the pop-up. Whereas, let's inform ourselves about what actually is happening a little bit before we even design our CDS. And doing that with a variety of ways, either getting retrospective data or running some decision support thing in, in silent mode uh, to get some understanding of what are your true and false positives. And then having that inform the appearance of your decision support. Even if it doesn't have great positive predictive value, that doesn't mean don't do it, but don't interrupt somebody. Uh, and, that's, and that's sort of the concept that we get to, uh, I sort of align this with uh, the unintended consequences, that often when there is misalignment of this positive predictive value and the prescriptive nature of the CDS is when we get into trouble. And you get into two kinds of trouble. Either we have way too much noise for the signal and we have, uh, and we have a state of alert fatigue where no alerts really get any attention paid to at all, or somebody does pay attention, too much attention, to that low positive predictive value but intrusive alert, and we end up with bad outcomes and patients getting harmed. So again, now I've totally terrified all the, the non-informaticists in the room when we're doing this education, and so I say, and so now we try to present a way that they can think about their problem uh, in a way that informs or hopefully develops better clinical decision support. So the five rights, we often will uh, look in sort of the retrospectoscope at decision support and say, hey, did it do this? Did it meet those five rights? But how can we get to those, uh, meeting those five rights from the beginning? And so this is sort of the model that's emerged uh, as we work with these quality improvement projects to help them get to that right intervention. Uh, and it starts with that improvement goal. We're starting with the problem. We're not starting with our solution. We're not starting with the hammer. We're starting with the problem. And most likely their problem is tied to an improvement goal. And that improvement goal is tied to some kind of behavior change, something different that they want somebody to do. And so once they do that, we work through these questions. You know, who is that person? What information do they need? When do they need it? And what do you want them to do? And these things are pretty familiar, right? So this is a, some initial quality improvement questions. What is the problem? What needs to change? All the great quality improvement driver diagrams and FMEAs can feed into that. And then these are our CDS rights, just sort of flipped into a question format. And we have found that by going through this process of thinking about the problem and decision support, we greatly reduce a lot of those inefficiencies and satisfaction issues when it comes to development. We certainly don't solve every problem and not every CDS that comes from this approach is, is perfect in terms of outcomes, but it really has helped streamline that development process and has been a great learning experience for both groups. So what impact has it had on this? Uh, it, it's, it's not, it's, it's been a learning process and a slow process for, uh, for all of us, but I'll give one example um, that, we, that was part of this process. Where, where, I don't know if we're getting it right, but I think we got it a little bit better in terms of going through steps. Um, so this is, um, I think we got a couple minutes left and we're just about wrapping up. Um, so this is our febrile neonate pathway uh, for, uh, for infants who are hospitalized, neonates who are hospitalized with fever and get a, uh, a neonatal uh, a sepsis workup. Um, and the improvement goal that they identified was reducing length of stay for these patients. Uh, and so this is the pathway in detail. Please don't try to read all these words, but I'll focus on a couple things that we were doing well. We had an order set, a great order set with decision support to get you that right dose for that right indication for the right age group. Um, but we were falling short in some areas, as noted by the improvement goal. So they could be discharged in 24 hours if their workup was entirely negative and the baby is well appearing. Um, uh, we, didn't, we were not able to see well appearing in, in the data of the EHR, but we could see a lot of these other things. Uh, and if, if, the, if their workup was a little bit inconclusive, TAP was hemorrhagic, um, 36 hours was the potential time they could be discharged. And discharge planning, when they should be following up with the pediatrician, uh, uh, what things they should be thinking about, if they have fever, what they should be doing, don't come right back to the ER necessarily. Um, so none of that was really had any decision support or any communication assistance within the EHR. 
And so we started with our problem. What needed to change? Prescribers needed to identify patients uh, eligible for timely discharge, notify nursing, um, and, and, and support families in trying to plan for that event. What information do they need? Well, they need culture results, they need access to additional labs if they want to look, and they need access to the pathway for additional reference. Uh, when do they need it? They need it uh, at, a, at a negative workup uh, and an admission and discharge. So right then and there, at admission, a lot of this stuff is still cooking. We knew we weren't going to have a great positive predictive value. Uh, but what action is expected? Again, communication to nursing and care coordination and anticipatory guidance for the families. And so with that, our CDS was a lot more straightforward to design with those questions answered. The patient ages, that they weren't in the NICU, uh, uh, that they had had a complete workup, that they had negative cultures, HSV was negative or not ordered. Um, and again, speaking of that low positive predictive value, we knew that this was, uh, should be something that was going to be non-interruptive, embedded in workflows, but not something that was going to be stopping people from getting their work done. And it should, importantly, disappear when the appropriate actions had been taken um, uh, or a discharge order had been placed. Uh, and so this is what we ended up with, and it's you know it, an out of the box looking best practice advisory from uh, uh, that we put custom content in according to the pathway. So it has information uh, saying that the patient may be eligible for discharge 24, 36 hours. It only appears based on those criteria. It pulls in the blood culture, uh, any cultures that have had, and the date and time of collection, so they can know that 24, 36 hour window. Uh, it has additional access to the pathway, uh, so they can review the full pathway if they'd like. Uh, they can have a quick uh, pop-up access to all the other labs if they want to review sort of what their white count was or what their UA was, although it doesn't matter if the cultures are negative. Um, but they can see all those other labs in case they want, or the electrolytes if, they, uh, if that had been checked as well. And then there are orders here that are the action piece. So uh, they provide an order that goes to the patient instructions and one that goes to the nurse. They can snooze it for themselves for six hours in case they, things are still cooking and they want to they see it, but just not right now. And this is the, these are the orders that get placed, and these are the instructions that go to the family, all per the pathway guidelines. And then some other sort of quick things that we've done as part of this work, again, the rapid cycle improvement. We were finding that broadly our pathway order sets uh, weren't getting used as much as we would like, and, and really a lot of that was due to the fact that people had to remember to use them. We didn't have, we had some suggestions for them, but those were kind of subtle. And he said, well, if we have pretty good criteria that we feel have a decent positive predictive value for using the pathway, well then let's be a little bit more intrusive about how, or a little bit more integrated in how we present the content for that pathway. So rather than having separate order sets for all these, well we built them into little mini order sets that based on certain criteria, automatically get suggested within the admission order set that they're already using. Um, and so, and they can opt out of it, or they can always pull these up via a reference links at the bottom, which you see here. Uh, but this workflow integration in, in a couple of these examples, uh, or a couple of these order sets actually led to increased pathway use. Um, and so here, this is sort of the, the, the time when we integrated all of these. Um, and we definitely saw an uptick in our febrile neonate uh, and, uh, and pneumonia use. Uh, UTI is, is lagging a little bit, but um, that's a pretty, that's really just like an antibiotic that's in that order group. So um, that might be, might be why people are, either putting the antibiotic in before they even get to the uh, admission order set. But we're seeing some improvement there. But again, part of this sort of rapid cycle improvement of looking at how we can better deliver our decision support. And we also have some, some great things on the way. This is a, a possible uh, a deterioration tool that we're building with the, uh, with the ICU sort of to detect their hot spots. Maybe I'll be back with this next year uh, to talk about how it worked, or maybe you'll never hear about it again if it doesn't work so well. Um, but uh, I think this, sort of to summarize, this, this partnership um, uh, has really been uh, beneficial for both groups. And where we're looking to go with it is scaling, to, is scaling it to other groups. So we have obviously a strong quality group, but we have a strong patient safety group. We have a strong operational initiative group. And I think they could, uh, we could all benefit from increasing these kinds of partnerships to develop um, projects that are less about um, keeping the lights on, which we still have to do, but can really do some of those proactive things to, you know, to to raise the bar, move the needle forward, all those things. Uh, and then, um, as we get more established with it, finding a way to do academic output from this work. Um, the informatics literature definitely lends itself to quality improvement uh, work and quality improvement uh, analysis methods. So uh, just because we're not necessarily doing a randomized controlled trial doesn't mean we can't be sharing what we've accomplished with our colleagues. So I, I think we're over by just a couple minutes. Um,
uh, but we have a little bit of time for, for questions. Thank you all for your attention.